The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Pit Life Barbecue Podcast. Join us around the pit as we talk all things barbecue. Now here is your host, Johnny Mag. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Pit Life Barbecue Podcast, coming to you live from the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe in Salem, New Hampshire. Welcome back to part two of our two episode (laughs) of picking your proteins and preparing your proteins for your next competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the barbecue broker is... Still with me today? Yes, sir. Also, we're still joined by Mr. Clarence Joseph from Mama and Papa Joe's, Papa Joe himself. Yes, yes. But let's get right into (coughs) this so we can get right to the... How to prep. Brass tacks. Ah. There you go. There you go. (laughs) It's been a while. It's been a while. (laughs) Today's episode brought to you by... Uncle Steve's Shake. If you're wondering why no one's coming to your barbecues, but they're lining up at... The buddy down the streets, because your buddy's probably using Uncle Steve's shake, and apparently you're not, <laughs> which means one thing. Chrissy. You better get you some. Damn straight Uncle Steve's shake is handmade. Comes in 12 amazing flavors. If you can if you can cook it, Uncle Steve has a shake for it. If you have any shake questions, Uncle Steve has fantastic customer service. He'll walk you through all your shake needs. It's time to take your backyard game and your competition game to that next level. What Uncle Steve Shake? Shake some on everything. Check him out at UncleSteveShake.com. Uncle Steve Shake Nation on Facebook. Also brought to you by... Two Guys Smoke Shop at TwoGuysCigars.com. Whether we're barbecuing or not, we always keep the smoke rolling. Thanks to our friends at TwoGuysCigars.com. And today we are still smoking the Arturo Fuente Grand Reserva. I relight mine. <laughs> mine went out too. <laughs> doing a little bit too much talking, part one. Which is all right. Yeah. Thanks to my friends at twoguyscigars.com. You get to smoke some of the best cigars in the world, and so can you. Just visit twoguyscigars.com for your perfect barbecue companion. That's the number two, guyscigars.com. Also brought to you by... Backline Fabrication, Backline Smokers, Mr. Ryan Newland in Austin, Texas, pumping out some of the best offset smoker competition carts on the market. Not one uh, pit looks the same. The possibilities are endless. He puts his heart and soul into every build, learns about what you're looking for, incorporates those into your pit, which truly makes it a one of a kind. Hence, you know Johnny's brand new awesome pit. Check out Ryan Newland at backlinefabrication.com. Check him out at backlinefab uh, on Instagram. And I know they're doing a raffle for a, his latest multi tool. So go check them out. Also brought he's to you by... He's doing a waffle? He's doing a waffle. waffle. He's doing a waffle. <clears throat> a waffle. <clears throat> a waffle. Yeah. Magnus Chef waffle. Gloves. Brother Alan Fonte knows something about Mi- um, Miami Fire. Yes. Miami Dade. He, he does. Is. He does because he is. Knows a little fire <laughs> management because he is a Miami Dade fire fighter. Back to backs are hard. He yeah. thought of all <laughs> these. Hey, I'm a rookie. I've only been at this for four years now. <laughs> He thought of oh, everything with, with the construction of these gloves. Food grade silicone, patented magnetic clips for an easy on and off. Heat rated up to 500 degrees, a web fit for firm grip, one size fits all, dishwasher safe. But if the web fit isn't your style and your more traditional five finger glove, he has you covered with his Freedom Glove line. Your traditional five finger glove, 14 inch. Gauntlet to protect your forearms, no more forearm sizzles, and these are heat rated up to not up to 932 degrees. And yes, they work. That's awesome because muscle memory bit me in the ass, and I grabbed into my firebox thinking I had the gloves, <laughs> and I was sorely mistaken. Ouch, yeah. Just, yeah, wow. you could hear that one real quick. Which is a, oh, which yeah. is a, a, you know, it just shows you they're, they're that comfortable. They, they, they're that comfortable. They're and they work. And in, 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 bing, bing, done. I love my red pair. Still got them. They still work great. Yeah. Check them out at magnuschef.com and at checkout use the code Freedom Live for ten percent off your order. 
That's Freedom Live for 10% off your order. Magnus Chef Gloves, Master the Fire, and Freedom Gloves, Take a Stand, Free Your Hands. Mm. Also brought to you by Custom Cutting Boards, RS.com. Ian Hemming out of Magnolia, Texas, is building what we call the Yeti of cutting boards. Mm. These boards take an absolute beating. And my heavy-handed friend over here can be is proof of that. Mm-hmm. From your standard dishwasher board, so your standard countertop board, to the absolutely massive 18 by 36 inch brisket board, to the pizza board for that perfect slice every time. UV protection, deep cut reservoir. Ugh. Deep juice reservoir. Deep juice. There, re- go. there he goes. <laughs> Catch all that juicy goodness. The rubber nubs on the bottom, so even on a wet surface, these boards will not slip on you. Multicolors available, engraving available with your team name, whatnot, your name, you know, hell, put the alphabet around the sides. He'll do it. You never know. (laughs) Check them out at customcuttingboardsrus.com. That is the letter R, us. Dot com. Good stuff right there. All right, let's go. Let's go. Part two. We left off with the shopping for your meats. Do them ahead of time. Wet aging briskets. Wet aging briskets and a couple great tips and secrets of freezing, then, then vacuum sealing. Yep, yep. And wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So now we're into the apps actual prepping of these meats and proteins Mm -hmm. for the competitions. So, CJ, I'd like to start with the ribs, because last week we were um, hinting towards that would kind of hit both of them. So, a lot of competitions, what what, what does everybody cook? Is is it the baby backs, or is it around uh, here? A a St. Louis cut? Around here. And at least in, in KCBS around here, in the Nebs competitions, um, I'm seeing people go spare rib in St. Louis style. On um, Barbecue Pitmasters, which we all, we've all obviously watched the show back when they first came out, you always would hear them say, I'm going with St. Louis, feed the judges. They like more, you know, a bigger bite, more meat. Judges like to eat. Or they wouldn't be judging barbecue food. So give them, you know, and they present... I hear a little bit better in the box. But yet, I've seen guys kill it with baby backs. So I'd like to hear what CJ has, his opinion, yeah. and what he sees Because I out like there. The, the St. Louis style cut. Mm-hmm. But when you're at shopping yeah. for them, you can get St. Louis style. And at the, the prices nowadays, it was at, at the store the other day, they were, you know, $18 a rack. So I always liked buying. The, the full spares. Mm, always cheaper, yep. Because they're much cheaper, and all you do have to do is find the end of that bone, That's it. the top Comes of the to bone, piece. between the rib tips and the regular ribs itself, and just whoosh, slice right on. Yeah. And, you, you know, you got to do a little extra trimming to you doing anyway. even everything up. Yeah, But yep. you can get a beautiful, uh, you know, St. Louis-style rack of ribs. Right there for half of the, half your cost, right. which saves you in the long run, you know, because that's all they're doing. And I think that they're the, charging I, a premium on I it. think that, and, and, and CJ can correct, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think that the reason that the people pick them also uh, spares is because they have technically more marbling, which could be more flavorful, all right? Yep. Um, so, um, you know, but people like the baby backs because they're tender. You get them really tender. So if you, you can make your spare as tender as a baby back, you kind of get the best of both worlds. What do you think about that, CJ? Now, let me tell you right off the bat, fellas, I am not a fan of baby backs. And I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan not because they don't taste good because, yeah, they taste good. I just think that there's a lot more flavor, a lot more uh, oomph to a good spare rib. Mm. Like you said, uh, you're going to have uh, fattier uh, a more marbled uh, cut of rib. You know, uh, baby backs can be much leaner than a mm. spare. Uh, so I, uh, I definitely prefer spare ribs. I think for a competition box, the curve, that harder curve 
in a uh, in a baby back is not going to be quite as attractive as a flatter uh, spare rib in that box. Uh, uh, I also like uh, your ability to to cut that spare rib down to whatever size you choose to to really fill that box, you know, as opposed to a, a baby back, which uh, uh, more more often than not, or what, uh, right around four and a half uh, or so inches wide. Yeah. You know, they they just don't look as pretty yeah. in a box, uh, in my opinion. Uh, now, now, let me let me say right off the bat, that's my opinion. You know, there are going to be a lot of folks that feel differently for whatever uh, uh, reason. And uh, you're, you're more than welcome to, to use and go with whatever you choose. Uh, that is just me. I want a baby back. And nine times out of ten, man, uh, I'm going to be buying full size. Uh, I want a, a spare rib, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, nine times out of ten, I'm going to be buying a full uh, spare rib. Has not been St. Louis. Mm. You know, I can get a, a seven-pound full rack of spare ribs for give or take uh, twelve, thirteen dollars. Meanwhile, if I go to get a, let's say it's a, a it's a nice St. Louis cut. If I go to get a, uh, a three pound St. Louis cut, I might be paying upwards of eighteen dollars, right? And all the butcher did, or all that processor did, was knock off the tips. Yep. That brisket bone area, yep. uh, as it's sometimes called. Yeah, and and immediately they've tacked on another dollar uh, seventy five per pound just for that slice, you know. So uh, uh, you'll get, you're going to get more bang for your bucks by you making that slice at home, whether it be for the backyard or for a competition. Do it mm. yourself. All it requires is a heavier, sharper knife, man. Uh, uh, figure out a, a way that you're going to get straight lines. And uh, and and get that done yourself. Just follow that and, notch. Uh, go right straight across. Yeah. And find that little yep. notch. Yeah. And go like right you said, yeah. find that longest bone uh, someplace in the center, and uh, go from there. That's going to alleviate a problem with the with the bones and and some of the little finger cartilage that mm. tends to stick out and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but another, uh, the more you do it, the better you get uh, in being able to get some nice clean lines as you're trimming ribs. Uh, one of the things I always try to encourage folks is to pop that rack of rib in your freezer for 20 or 30 minutes before you start uh, getting ready to trim. Mm. You can pull it out the cryovac, get it cleaned up, dried off, whatnot, put it on a rack and just pop it in your freezer. Uh, just tighten it up, firm up that, uh, that, uh, that piece of meat. Uh, and then with a good sharp knife, man, you're going to be able to carve out you know, where you get the heavier cuts, uh, the heavier layers of fat, you're going to be able to carve that layer of fat out, thin it out. That way, no judge is going to get a, uh, a mouthful of some fat that's not going to render properly. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you'll get a beautiful rack of spare ribs. And right around the, uh, the front of the bones where you expect that pullback, you're going to see some heavier layers of fat. Uh, folks, all you need is a good sharp knife. Uh, that's going to get that out of there for you, man, without uh, destroying that bone, without creating shiners. Mm. And uh, for those of you out there who might not know, a shiner would be an exposed bone on a rack of rib. Uh, such, a, uh, such a bone would really make that uh, particular uh, rib useless in terms of competition. Yeah, right, right. Also, the spares fit better, like you said, in the boxes. It, you don't want to get sauce underneath the cover no. of the box when they open it up. You don't want sauce. And I practiced with home, at home with a set of baby backs I had, and it was hard to get them with that yeah. bone curve and to shut that yeah. box. you got to do yeah. almost half the layer of greens to make that fit. Well, we will, in the, at least in KCBS, we're doing greens. We're not doing like a foil bottom, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, I've actually saw Harry Sue <clears throat> from Slappy Daddy – um, do uh, box preps, mm. and he does it very interesting because he'll he has the four boxes, and each setup is different. 
because of what he's cooking. Mm. And even you know, on the rib ones, he actually does, in, at least in this video, and I'm assuming it's legal, be, but you could also, I guess you could also look at it as in mocking the box technically. What's he doing? He does a, um, basically a picture frame, if you will. That in the box, he, he builds, you know, a frame of greens, and the middle part is still the, em is empty. Still has the, the bottom of the white For Casey box yes. <laughs> exposed, and he lays the bones in that spot. Center. Interesting. So that there's no chance of the top lid touching those ribs. What? So, yeah. so, so the ribs... Are sitting on the on the foam on the bottom of the foam because he's sitting built a frame on the it. foam, but still gives the appearance that it's still sitting on a full bed of green. It just looks recessed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No shit. And and you know you think about it, they uh, the yeah. only the only uh, restrictions are what types of greens you can use down there. Right. Uh, no red. How leaf. you choose the structure that that bed. Is totally up to you. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it, as long as it doesn't spell that. slap your daddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be frowned upon. Yeah. Uh, no red leaf and no pooling of sauces. Things, little things like and, that and you have to look for. A, that's a great point, uh, uh, Greg. Uh, you know, our first American Royale in 2013, the first year of Mom and Papa Joe's, 2013, we went to uh, brand new cooks. We went to uh, the American Royale. Uh, did our practicing at home and whatnot, and, but never once thought about, and it might not have been the best of practices as I look back, because we really did not gauge uh, the height requirements for the greens. And I remember, you know, we got chicken turn in, we were good. Uh, then we get to rib, uh, and we load our, our box with ribs and uh, go to close it, and what do you know? Too high. Uh, and, uh, man, you know, so we pull the ribs out. We restructure that box. Uh, long story short, uh, we missed turning. Mm. You know, we missed turning that first American Royale for painful. ribs. Uh, it's painful. Oh which my was God. painful. Oh. I, remember my wife coming, I remember my wife coming back and just sort of slinging uh, the, uh, the pizza carrier oh, on the table. No. And I was like, whoa. There's something uh, still in that carrier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds heavy. That's said, so heavy. And she said, we missed turning. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Shit. But, uh, you know, with, 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 with KCBS, man, you do not have time to cry. Yeah. Because you're, 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 you're immediately, after one turning, you're immediately working on another turning. You know, Half like, hour between each one. So, yeah. So that was a, a lesson learned. But great point. And I like that idea that, uh, that, ha that you mentioned about Harry. That's yeah. It, I, I, the first time I saw it, I'm like, whoa. That's cool. That's interesting, you know, and it makes perfect sense. You may or not, you may or may not see that uh, picture of that floating around my social media in the coming weeks <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I practice. Oh, practice. damn straight, damn straight. You know, so like I said, how, how much work goes into the, the trimming of ribs? Obviously, we all like, especially during competitions, it, I do it regardless. I always take that membrane off the back because I don't want to get the, that, uh, the hard chew in there for leaving it on. Some people take it off. Most people take it off. Some people just score it. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, it for catering, I, break I down. score it. And I cook hotter, though, and it's going to kind of melt off melt, anyway. Yeah. But you don't have that. You don't have that leeway if someone get if they take a bite of rib and a little bit of that didn't melt away yeah. and it just comes off in that bite. No, no, that's now good. on the top side of the rack, CJ. How much of that fat are you going to be taking off? I want to expose that marbled pink meat. Mm. And uh, man, I, I did a uh, I did a YouTube video uh, last or a week before last. Where I did some oven ribs. My boys have been giving me grief uh, I've seen that video. <laughs> about doing some oven ribs. But I will tell you, uh, if you go and you look at that, you want to see what a perfect rack of competition ribs should look like in terms of marbling? Go look at that uh, oven rib that I did, man. The thin, 
the the frequent thin strips or thin thin lines of white in that pink just uh dispersed in that pink so evenly mm. i mean absolutely beautiful and that is what a comp rib uh you want to look like if remind me if i'm correct here but i believe if i remember correctly that rack was duroc no Ooh, no greg i'm not gonna pay for durocs uh, I, I thought I, I, I thought it was I thought you had said this is a, a nice uh, a rack of Durox. I could have yeah, sworn they were uh, they were Smithfields. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you, uh, and don't get me wrong. Unless again you're able to handpick Durox, man, they tend to be a, a little smaller than I like to cook. Uh, and I I consider myself a a power rib cook. You know, I'm cooking them a little hotter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am uh, I I'm really putting the heat to them, and a Duroc uh, for my style of comp cooking, I won't won't put up very well. I would I would have to do a whole lot of adjusting in terms of heat and timing if I wanted them to uh, come out normally. Cut but uh, man, I'm cooking a very thick Smithfield rib uh, nine times out of ten. Uh, that other time it's going to be an IBP or a Prairie Fresh. Both very good. Uh, but, uh, man, when I'm done with a rack of uh, – uh, prepping a rack of spare ribs, uh, if they're the thick ones that I'm normally cooking, uh, they're going to be weighing upwards of two-plus pounds, you know. Right. Uh, these these things are going to be healthy. Mm. That box is going to be healthy. So uh, take a look at that, uh, that, that oven rib video, and you will see the absolute perfect rack of rib. You will see how – I took that sharp knife and carved out uh, those areas where the fat was too heavy, mm. just leaving a thin film of that fat covering that pink meat, man. It's going to render well. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to latch on to those seasonings, create a nice crust, uh, and that is what you are looking for in a, in a competition rib. Mm. And like I said earlier, even if I'm cooking at home, man, I'm going to look for the best meats I can possibly get. That's it. You the best. You don't want to break the habit. You always just keep that frame yes, of Yes, sir. Mind. So have you, have you ever used, have you ever cooked uh, Crown Reserves ribs? I, I have not. Have you heard of them? I have not. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I've recently developed a, uh, a relationship with, uh, with RC Ranch Wagyu. Ooh. Oh. Uh, there's, a, there's a farm, a, uh, a cattle farm right uh here in Texas, and uh, they they also raise and sell a breed of uh, heritage <laughs> hogs. Oh, okay. So in my next order, I'm going to be getting uh, uh, a couple of cuts of this heritage breed. Wow, uh, that's you know notch which right there. which of course is is going to be a high end cut. You know, it's not commodity pork. Right, right. Uh, this is going to be something that that would be comp quality. Uh, I am thinking. So really looking forward to, to seeing what that's going to be about. Excellent. But uh, for the most part, man, I haven't spent any extra money on, uh, on pork. I, uh, many years ago, I bought some, uh, some Duroc pork butts mm -hmm. uh, for, a, uh, for, for KCBS. And I did not see much difference uh, from the standard Smithfield pork butter. So, so I've, I've re I'm resigned that uh, I won't spend that kind of money. Uh, on on something like that, it's two hundred dollars to buy the competition Duroc pork pack. You get four ribs, two butts, and it's fifty bucks for shipping. Wow! I spent two fifty on pork, and honestly, yeah. we didn't love the product. The ribs were decent, but they weren't anything better than I think a Smithfield or yeah. a Prairie Fresh. And and we spent a lot of money on that. Yeah, a lot of yeah. money. Yeah. Now, great segueing into the pork butt. The pork butt. Now, we had hinted, we had talked with last week's episode mm -hmm. of actually now that you, now you are able to remove the money muscle and cook that separate now mm -hmm. instead of really being a surgeon because you had <laughs> to cook it whole. And it is literally <laughs> hanging on by a thread, a little little sinew on either side. 
<laughs> until it hits that 165, and then you can take it off because technically at that point, it's legally it's cooked. cooked. Yeah. We're also assuming that everyone out there listening knows what a money muscle is. So just before we get into that, maybe CJ briefly explain what the money muscle is and why you go to P- uh, comp guys lean towards serving that cut of the pork butt. Well, the money muscle is, uh, is definitely uh, aptly named. Uh, the money muscle is a part of a pork butt uh, that is supremely marbled, well, well uh, so tender. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, a loin. Filet mignon it's of the tubular. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tubular shaped, man, uh, and it can extend uh, based on the, uh, the animal, based on the, uh, the cut. It can extend uh, a good six inches. Uh, sometimes there'll be four, uh, but, and how thickly you cut your, uh, your money muscle into medallions can, will determine how many medallions you get, uh, to put in that box. So, uh, that money muscle can be carved out. Like you mentioned, uh, when you have the cook it attached, it can be carved out and shaped and left attached by just a little bit of, uh, uh, little dangler. Uh, a piece of meat or fat or whatever the case might be and then cook. A little dangler. But, but today you're now able to separate that money muscle completely and cook it by itself. And here in Texas, uh, the, the trend is moving towards cooks just filling their box with money muscle. That's what we're seeing. I'm talking to the point where cooks are now uh, cooking six money muscles in a uh, for a given competition. Yep. Uh, meat markets are now starting to sell just money, money muscle. muscle. Mm-hmm. All right, they're repurposing uh, what's left of that butt. Uh, so don't get me wrong, that grinding it up for sausage or, or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which are the, yeah, the money exactly. muscles like almost? I think on the opposite side of where you find like the bone. Yes, the bone yeah, you got the a bone side. Bone in, in opposite the, end. In the the grain, you can tell it just goes a completely different way than the rest of it. But but is it true? Because I I haven't really figured this out yet. There's a fake money muscle. It's like a facade of the outside of the miles. You trim back to expose the real money muscle. Any insight on that? Well, there there is such a thing as a uh, what people call a false fat cap. Yes. On a money muscle. Yes. And you will see it on one end. You'll just see a little white line, uh, and that yes. white line indicates uh, a layer of fat that might run down a, a quarter of inch. Uh, towards one end of uh, that money muscle. Uh, The money muscle is not the easiest thing to trim out, you know, especially for uh, a starting cook. This is something you're really going to want to play with. Mm. Uh, You've got some cooks out there, man, that do a really awesome job. Uh, They can take a small money muscle, and the way they trim it uh, with the surrounding meat, they can make that that three-inch circumference now go to uh, uh, four inches, mm. uh, including some of the surrounding uh, tissue, so to speak. So there's an art to trimming a money muscle. You know, you look across social media, you're going to see some beautiful money muscle mm-hmm. and uh, uh, in some boxes, in some turning boxes. And then you'll see some money muscles that aren't quite so pretty. Uh, and again, it's all about that trim. It is all about that trim. Uh but man, there's nothing prettier than a, a box filled with medallions mm. of that money muscle, you know, nicely glazed uh, and, and just about perfectly uh, perfect in circumference, nice and round. Uh, but, but it's not easy to get to. It takes a lot of practice. And one it of the things of is, is when you trim them, if you don't trim it right after it's cooked and you go to trim them for the box, I think that if you didn't get that separation of that fat seam out, they're going to split on you when you cut They're going to split. That's yeah. the problem. Is yeah. They're going to split. You can cook a perfect one, but then it just almost splits like it's a, it, it, at the seam. And it, then you don't have – you have a yeah. medallion, but it's like open. Like if you if you, if you you didn't tie your ribeye and, it, and it, it opened up at the fat yeah. seam. Yeah. Same, kind of, same kind of deal. So they're difficult. I, I have found that if you if you trim less – before cooking, and then after cooking, finish your trim, it removes a lot of that splitting. 
You're not removing so bark you when you do you that? Don't. You're not removing precious bark from the exterior? Uh, yes, you're going to remove some bark, but that bark is usually going to be on the, the side that lays down in your box. Huge. It's going to be on the side that lays down in your box. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Uh, that's how I have played with it. And they have to judge you and on I, appearance. I you, yeah, uh, they can't look behind it and judge you. They only judge first. They yeah. look at it. They pass it down, and everyone, you know, looks with their eyes first. So whatever's on the back doesn't really matter because once they pick it up, they can't rejudge appearance. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that, that, that bottom side is usually where you've done the trimming to mm. – uh, to try to alleviate some of that that splitting, mm. but uh, like I said, the trend in Texas right now, man, is, is moving towards money muscles, uh, and uh, man, they 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 are beautiful. You know, back in the days, uh, uh, I think cooks were really really into a variety of muscles in that box. Call it you know, meat. you might see you might see a strip of uh, money muscle medallions, yeah, a strip of chunks, mm. uh, then maybe some pull. Or maybe the ice uh, cream, the spaghetti, or the ice cream. Yeah, that the, made from the, the ribbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the bacon, making the little buttons bacon from the bacon. Swirled into little ribbons. Little ice cream things. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there there were just so many things that could be done, uh, and uh, and that was pretty cool. You know, I started out the first time I did money must I cooked an entire pork butt, and then as I learned more about it, I realized all right, I can shorten the cook by trimming it down, uh, and. Uh, I think the next, if I do another uh, competition where pork butt is involved, I might see if I could, if I can't just do two or three pork butts. I'm not going to spend money for six, uh, for, for six. Uh, that's a, that's, that's a uh, lot. Money muscles, yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's a much shorter cook. I think it's a simpler cook. Uh, uh, as long as you you've got your timing down, and man, the uh, when properly cooked, the end results are absolutely beautiful and tasty. Amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the pork butt gets overlooked a lot by competitors when it comes to competition. They're focusing on there's the scraping of the chicken for the chicken, and then there's like the perfect cut of the ribs and how you're trimming them. And then everyone obviously uh, stresses over the brisket because it's a it's the hottest meat in barbecue. And I feel like the pork butt gets overlooked a lot, but there's more than meets the eye with the pork butt. Oh, absolutely. It's it it is the most forgiving. Uh, of, the of the meats to yep. cook, mm. you know, but like you said, there's so many different pots you can use and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all that. Now that's we've hit ribs, we've hit pork butt. Obviously, we get to chicken. Don't th really think we need to hit too much on chicken because that's what everybody really practices <laughs> to get that bite through skin, bite through skin, and so you're really, you know, taking it off. Removing that knuckle, scraping down to a thin, almost transparent. And I think people get that down. They get that down, but I think the problem is a lot the color, getting the right color. On, right, the right the color is, is, is the key. And yeah. all that's going to do is more practice. Get your time right, get your temp right, get the right spot of your smoker. The right seasonings, maybe. The right seasoning. Too much pepper might make yep. it too dark or whatever, or too Things much sugar like that. might make it burn or, you know. But you know, it, it's it's easy to see. It's easy to practice chicken. You know, it's a short cook. Mm. It's a fairly cheap cook, unlike some of the other meats. Uh, there's doesn't require a whole lot of, of setup. Uh, now, with that said, some of the the best KB, KCBS cooks, from what I understand, uh, say that that they don't scrape chicken skin. Right. You know, that's uh, becoming a, uh, they're trending so, outwards. Not people not doing that now. But antibiotic-free yeah. chicken is the key because. There's less fat under the skin, so it renders, renders down. Yeah. And I also see people perforating their chicken. Yeah, uh, a jacquard. Yeah, hitting the skin, yeah. making some holes in it so yeah. it steams yeah. out. And I have also was, was listening to someone did, did literally the other day, uh, on Monday, was saying, um, you know, he'll get his everything prepped, mm -hmm. then he'll let it sit <clears throat> uh, in the fridge, uncovered. You know, dry out the skins. A bunch of hours, you know, like like three to four hours. Yeah. Because that meat is going once it's dry, it's going to oh I'm sorry. He um brines them. Yes. But you can't do then, that before the comp, only at the comp. Yeah. Right. But he he'll have it sit there 
in his cooler or mm-hmm. at the, you know, obviously on a comp site or if he's at house, he has it in the fridge. And that meat is going to pull, the, well, with that salt intake, is going to pull all as much moisture, which is going to pull out of that skin. So he's salt brining, not wet brining yeah. in that situation. In that situation. He, he wet brines it first. Got it. Then basically dry brines in okay. the fridge on its own, pulling that moisture out of the skin. And he says he, he gets it. He gets it every time. Nice. So I'm going to have to give that a shot. So many good methods. You also had a good method back in the day of the... Uh Oh, the, 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 the cornstarch. Cornstarch in there. Cornstarch. But that's more helps. backyard. Because that's some more backyard on the wings. Yeah, yeah, you, need you, need a more. Higher, you need a higher heat. You need that soft bite for through, not a do. crispy yeah. skin for that. So Yeah, it doesn't it work on, on, on the... They work great on the chicken wing comp. Oh, hell yeah. At the Elks. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm, a huge, I'm a huge fan of dry brine. And then uh, as we mentioned that, uh, matter of fact, that is... I'm going to dry brine my first brisket. I'm doing a uh, dry brine brisket for a Super Bowl. And uh, I spoke to a buddy, uh, you know, uh, in the last couple of weeks. And uh, he said, man, you dry brine everything. I said, yeah, man, it really works. And he said, have you ever dry brine a brisket? And I was like, wow. You know, uh, I mean, pork, <laughs> chicken. Yeah. I was like, "How? why in the heck have I never thought about dry brine and a brisket? So uh, uh, I am doing a dry brine brisket uh, I'm going to uh, to uh, cook that uh, right before Super Bowl, man, and we'll see what we got. How long are you going to dry brine it for? Uh, at overnight. Yeah, that's all you really need for that. Yeah, dry yeah, that's all, yeah, that's all I need. I'm going to go overnight, so you're, I'm probably going to be looking at uh, give or take 12, 14 hours or so. So we, we yeah. put it in the container, and you're just going to dump a shit ton of salt, so it almost pretty much covers the entire. Uh, it's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be that much salt. You know, okay. the the rule of thumb is uh, a half a teaspoon to one teaspoon per pound of meat. Okay. So it's not going to be an excessive amount. But a little on the bottom, a little on top, basically. Yeah, right? yeah, it kinda yeah. Kinda comes together. So uh, I will do a light salt and kosher salt. Yep. Uh, uh, on on each side, put it on a raised rack. Got it. And just toss it in the fridge, uh, oh, uncovered. Rack. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. so, so really, so it doesn't really matter. So you're not really putting any salt under it. Then you're only pouring salt on top and letting it kind of soak. I, I'm going to do both drip. sides. I'll oh, do you are the fat cap. Okay. Yeah, I'll do the fat cap as well. Uh, I've done that to steaks. I've done that to picanha. I've done that to everything. Even uh, even meats with with a heavy fat cap, and I really, really love. Uh, the results. What about putting? That's why I was just kind of shocked that I had never thought about a brisket, man. Yeah. What about yeah. Um, like MSG in the night before too? That night might have the same effect where it's going to kind of get through the meat and give that that deep flavor kind of throughout the meat. Have you ever done anything like I, that? I am a fan of uh, MSG, and uh, it's used. Uh, I use MSG on every competition meat uh, for spray. But I have never. Or I have never put them directly. Uh, on a meat pre-cooked. Got it. Got it. So yeah, you use it like a spray, it right? right? Use it for spraying, make it shiny and stuff like that? I, I, uh, no, the MSG is a powder that I just mix in with with sauces. I mix in with rubs. Okay. Or so I have never uh, uh, put it in a, uh, in a spray format. Got it. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a spray form. Uh, and they're, 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 there are different MSGs out there, man. Uh, and it, it has been scientifically proven, you know, that MSG doesn't cause the headaches. The I whatnot. agree. Agree. Uh, it's in a lot of people's head. And we know how we are. Uh, if we think something is real, chances are <laughs> we're going to make it real. Mm-hmm. You fun, know, if we try hard enough. Fun fact is that MSG actually uh, derived originally from seaweed. Yeah. It's from seaweed. It's natural. It's natural. It's it it, it occurs naturally in in mm-hmm. in many of the things we eat, including fruits. Mm-hmm. You know, it is there. So uh, uh, I uh, it's been proven, and man, I love it. Uh, it it's it's just a a, a huge flavor enhancer. In, 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 and and actually, amps up everything. Brisket and uh, MSG is naturally found in brisket from the cooking yeah. from the cooking process. So I had a guy, seen a guy video with a guy to test, see if this MSG, trying to break, crack Franklin's code and see if this MSG in his brisket and, and the whole thing is that there's actually MSG in brisket 
anyway naturally yes. occurring. Now, before we run out of time. Oh, it's our time already. Shit. CJ has sent us a little something, something on a little short clip of you actually <clears throat> trimming a brisket. Ah, yes. So, folks, if you're listening, go to the video aspect because you're not going to want to miss this. Chrissy, hit that. Pro, That's right, pro there. right there. Pro moves right there, live and in living color. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to see the full length version, go to the description below. We'll drop a link in for you. That was just a teaser, y'all. Talk so. to me about the scissors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, He's what been are, itching about this all day. Oh. Obsessed with the scissors. <laughs> I need myself some shop kitchen shears. There you go. Often, uh, often give people a hard time who tell me, man, those scissors are awesome. I said, man, sh a tailor or a seamstress uses scissors. These are, these are shears. Shears. I get it right. Kitchen shears. <laughs> right, right. But, hey, uh, man, some great sharp shears are a must, man, to, to help you taper that brisket, to help you get rid of those angles. Uh, and we all know if we've got any type of experience cooking briskets, the angles tend to want to dry out, you know, mm. the right angles, the 90 degrees or whatever the case might be. Shop edges. So you just want to round that off. Yeah. yeah you just want to round that off to allow for the, the smooth flow of heat and smoke over that brisket as opposed to right angles with that smoke banging up against it, uh, that heat banging up against it. I uh, will cause those, uh, those edges to crisp, to dry out. And if your fire is hot, hot enough to burn. So that's where the shares come into play. And uh, I'm here to tell you, folks, I know that that no one brisket trim is going to satisfy everybody. Yeah. Uh, as a competition cook, I learned, I realized early, all right, this is what I want my end slice to look like. And when I say my end slice, the slices that are going in my turning box, mm. I understood how I wanted them to look. And now I had to develop a trim to get them to look that way. Uh, uh -huh. I think right now, man, I think it is easier uh, to separate uh, the flat from the point and then trim your flat, you know, uh, accordingly. I, though, I'm one of those cooks. I love turning in point and flat still attached. Okay. Uh -huh. Which I think I, is, I like. Uh, I like giving a taste judge the like option of cutting. Uh, if they prefer flat, they go for it. If they prefer point, they go for it. Hmm. So I want to turn in a fully intact slice of both point and flat. And for me to get that slice to where it is uh, visually appealing in the box, I had to develop a trim that's going to give me symmetry. Uh, bark on all sides, hmm. a nice rounded end. 
without heavy fat on that one side. Right. So that is how my brisket trim evolved. And it is not as easy as just separating the two, uh, uh, blocking that brisket, so to speak, that flat, so to speak, and then, you know, trimming your, your, your point for burnt ends. Uh, it's a little more difficult trying to figure out, all right, uh, I know during the cook, this, this point is going to shrink more than the flat. Mm-hmm. You know, how often do you see a picture of a brisket slice where uh, the, 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 the flat on top of the point is hanging over, you know, mm-hmm. in this method, in right. this manner? Right. All right. Uh, so now you've got to figure out how are you going to trim that brisket so that the, the point uh, as it renders and uh, 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 what, what, what word am I looking for? As it render, it wants to draw up underneath that flat. Right. But how do you get those two to line up in that end product? Yeah. So over time, I just came up with a way of beveling. I call it beveling, uh, you know, leaving that, that point uh, a little outside of that flat. And the two just, within an hour and a half of that cook, man, the two just line up perfectly, and I, I end up with a nice, beautiful slice uh, 19 times out of 20. With the fat you seam. You know, there's always... Still got the fat seam in there, right? I'm talking a yes, little, little yeah, with, with that thin fat seam in between, yes. And I did that for the yeah. first KCBS, but apparently found out the hard way that they don't want that fat seam in the KCBS. Yeah, yeah. They, if you have... And yeah. I, I cooked my, you know, usually fat side up. Yeah. So, you know, had I had flipped it, and I, I served it fat side up with the little seam with the point on top. Have I had flipped it upside down and cut that fat seam out, would have had my smoke ring on top, although they're not supposed to judge you on it. You know they do visually. It would have, it would have done much better, apparently. Yeah. So it's I, tricky. It's tricky. I, I was the same. Uh, first cook-off, uh, I actually turned in a KCBS, uh, turned in both point and flat, and it didn't do as well. Mm. And after that, yes, I did separate. Yeah. Yeah. I did separate, and they scored better. So KCBS is a different animal, you know. Uh, and I'm not saying that those judges aren't knowledgeable in 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 brisket, but here in Texas, everybody know, you know that that point hmm. is where uh, where the money is, man. In terms of a uh, of brisket, right, right. Uh, that's Man, that's 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 the part of a brisket I'm gonna eat nine times out of ten. Hundred yeah. uh, percent. Give me the give me the fatty, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you before we go. Sure. I'm gonna ask you a personal question. So get ready. All right. Okay. <laughs> you stretching? Watch out now. At what temp? Uh, at what temperature do you wrap your brisket <laughs> for competition? Man, I have not. I have not tempted a brisket in many a years before wrapping okay because i am i am i'm just at that point after cooking so many of them i know what my pit is going to do when it's going to do it but if i was the temp and i will tell you roughly uh, where do you think it is where do you think it is roughly i did a private class uh (laughs) january 6th and 7th right here at the house on this gentleman's pit and when it was time for that brisket I looked at that color on his pit. I had never cooked on his pit before. When it was time to wrap, I looked at that brisket. I don't, I, and I said, uh, that brisket is going to be between 165 and 170. Yep. Boom. We tempted. it. It was 168. <laughs> Dude, they, they, they were blown away. They were blown away on his pit. But I, I want to be between 165 and 170. So you are waiting that uh, a little bit higher. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. At uh, wrapping for competition. Right. For, a, for here at home backyard, I want to be pushing 180. That's what I do for catering. But I feel yeah. that the last KCBS I did, I took it to 165, 168 and wrapped it, which I figured was low enough. that The bark wasn't going to get too crispier around the edges or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But then I hear... People saying that they wrap it a lot lower when when the you know it doesn't don't look at the bark like you would for catering. It still needs to be dark, but not as dark. Yeah, exactly. And, and it will get yeah. darker in the wrap while it's cooking anyway. Yeah. So yeah, man. At, at home, I love a uh, a good dark, crunchy bark. Hell yeah. 
And uh, over the last year and a half, I have become a fan of the foil boat, boat method. I'm just going to ask you about yeah. the boat. Yeah, yeah. I I have become a fan of it's the a, boat method. You know, and I system. do it so often in videos and whatnot. People said, "Have you ever tried it in a competition?" I'm saying, "Nah, nah that is not a competition bark." No, definitely. You know, not. it it gets a little too crunchy. It gets yeah. a little too crusty uh, for competition, man. But at home, it is awesome. It's, <sighs> I think, I think Lewis and Lewis might have been the ones I think down, uh, that started that boat method. Possibly Lewis and Lewis, Possibly. but that's a great. Yeah, that's you great know, method. I don't know who came up with it, but Chud, uh, Chud's like I said, maybe? we've been competing. We've been competing since Chud. 2012, cooking briskets, whatnot. And I was shocked when I found out about it uh, a little under two years ago, and I was like, "Where in the hell has this been this entire time that <laughs> yeah. I'm only just finding out <laughs> right? about it?" Right, right. Yeah, but. Yeah. Well, Good awesome, stuff. CJ. Keep going. We, we, oh, we could do. We could. We, we could do. We could do six <laughs> volumes Three of this. Try special. You know. <laughs> but CJ, thank you so much for your time. You're generous with your time, and you know, and your knowledge and everything, and you know, uh, go, going deep on a bunch of the stuff. But you even have. If you want even more insight from CJ, please go to his YouTube channel. Mama and Papa Joe's, he's got numerous uh, videos on all types of trimming and prep on all different proteins. And uh, the, his channel is, is simply in, uh, a virtual encyclopedia of information. So okay. check that out. But, brother, much thank you so much. Fellas. Absolutely. Great seeing you, CJ. Absolutely. Hang in there one second, brother. My man. That was awesome. You know it, brother. Oh, I love Hell it. yeah, brother. That was good doing the Hell show. Hell yeah, that was good. That was good. Well, that's it for this week, folks. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Catch the audio wherever podcasts are found. Catch the video on Facebook, YouTube. You two hit that subscribe button and notification bell. You got all the episodes right there. All the links to social medias are listed down below. Questions and comments, please send them to pitlifebbqpodcast at gmail.com. Like always, subscribe, like, rate, and review. Hit that share button. Hit it. And until next week, keep, keep the, the smoke, smoke rolling. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.